Chapter number eight of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter eight John Toland. In the Augustan age of free thought, no British writer achieved more renown or performed greater services to biblical criticism than John Toland. His life would fill a volume, while his works would stock a library. True to his convictions, he spoke like a man and died as a hero. His books are strewn with classical illustrations, and deal so with abstract and to us uninteresting arguments, that we shall simply give a brief sketch of the life of this extraordinary man. He gave his thoughts to the scholars at the same time that Woolston addressed the people. Conjointly they revolutionized opinion in our favor. Toland was born on November 30th, 1670, at Londonderry in Ireland. It is said his registered name was James Junius, another account says Julius Caesar, but we have been unable to find any authentic date for either supposition, and whatever his name was registered, we have indisputable evidence that he was always called John Toland. We have less proof as to his parentage. Some writers allege that he was the natural son of a Catholic priest, while others contend that he was born of a family once affluent but at the time of his birth in very reduced circumstances. Whether this was the case, or the reverse, young Tolland received a liberal education. He was early taught the classics, studied in the Glasgow College, and on leaving Glasgow he was presented with letters of credit from the city magistrates, highly flattering to him, as a man and a scholar. He received the diploma of A.M. at Edinburgh, the day previous to the Battle of the Boyne, he finished his studies at the University of Leyden. The first work of importance which Toland published was A Life of John Milton, containing besides the history of his works several extraordinary characters of men and books, sects, parties, and opinions. This work, being violently opposed, was speedily followed by A Mentor, or A Defense of Milton's Life, containing one, a general apology for all writings of that kind, Two, a catalogue of books attributed in the primitive times to Jesus Christ, his apostles, and other eminent persons, with several important remarks relating to the canon of Scripture. Three, a complete history of the book, entitled Icon Basilica, proving Dr. Gowden and not King Charles I to be the author of it, etc. Those works established the fame of Toland, as well as formed the groundwork for persecution which hunted him even on his deathbed. In the year 1699, Toland collected, edited, and published from the original manuscripts the whole of the works of James Harrington, prefixed by a memoir of this extraordinary theorist. In his preface, he says that he composed this work in his beloved retirement at Cannon near Banstead in Surrey. From this, along with other excerpts scattered throughout his works, we cannot but infer that at the outset of his career he possessed a moderate competence of worldly wealth and social position. He says his idea was to transmit to posterity the worthy memory of James Harrington, a bright ornament to useful learning, a hearty lover of his native country, and a generous benefactor to the whole world a person who obscured the false luster of our modern politicians, and equaled, if not exceeded, all the ancient legislators. This to us is an interesting fact, for it shows the early unanimity which existed between the earlier reformers in politics and those of theology. The supervision of the Oceana by Toland bears the same inferential analogy, as if Mr. Holyoke were the biographer and publisher of the New Moral World and its author. In 1700 he published Anglia Libera, or The Limitation and Succession of the Crown of England, Explained and Asserted, etc. This book is concluded by the following apothegm, assuring the people that no king can ever be so good as one of their own making as there is no title equal to their approbation, which is the only divine right of all magistracy, for the voice of the people is the voice of God. 
In 1702, Tollen spent some time in Germany, publishing a series of letters to a friend in Holland, entitled, Some Remarks on the King of Prussia's Country, on his Government, his Court, and his Numerous Palaces. About this time appeared The Art of Governing by Parties. This was always a favorite subject of the old freethinkers, and is still further elucidated by Bolingbroke. In 1707 he published a large treatise in English and Latin as a Philippic oration to incite the English against the French, a work I have never seen. We now return to an earlier date, and shall trace the use of his theological works. The first of note, 1696, was Christianity Not Mysterious showing that there is nothing in the gospel contrary to reason, nor above it, and that no Christian doctrine can be properly called a mystery. As soon as this book was issued from the press, it was attacked with unmanly virulence. One man, Peter Brown, who was more disgustingly opposed to Tollen than the rest, was made a bishop, and by far the greatest majority amongst the Anglican clergy who attacked him were all rewarded by honors and preferment. The author was accused of making himself a new heresiarch, that there was a tradition amongst the Irish that he was to be a second Cromwell, and that Tolland himself boasted that before he was forty years old he would be governor over a greater country than Cromwell and that he would be the head over a new religion before he was thirty. One of his opponents publicly stigmatizes him as saying that he, Toland, himself designed to be as great an impostor as Mohammed, and more powerful than the Pope, while the Puritans denounced him as a disguised Jesuit, and the Papists as a rancorous nonconformist. To complete the comedy, the Irish Parliament condemned his book to be publicly burnt, some ecclesiastics loudly murmuring that the author should be burned with it. Others, more moderate, were anxious that Toland should burn it himself, while at last they came to a unanimous resolution to burn it in front of the threshold of his door, so that when the author appeared he would be obliged to step over the ashes of his own book which was accordingly done amid the brutal cheers of an ignorant and infuriated populace. As a proof of the high esteem in which Toland was held by the few able and liberal men of the day, we extract the following account from the correspondence of John Locke and Mr. Molyneux. The latter gentleman, writing to the former, says, I am told the author of Christianity Not Mysterious is of this country, and that his name is Tolland, but he is a stranger in these parts, I believe. If he belongs to this kingdom, he has been a good while out of it, or I have not heard of any such remarkable man among us. In another letter the same writer says, In my last letter to you there was a passage relating to the author of Christianity Not Mysterious. I did not then think he was so near me as within the bounds of this city, but I find sense that he has come over hither and have had the favor of a visit from him. I now understand that he was born in this country, but that he has been a great while abroad, and his education was for some time under the great Leclerc but that for which i can never honor him too much is his acquaintance and friendship to you and the respect which upon all occasions he expresses for you i propose a great deal of satisfaction in his conversation i take him to be a candid freethinker and a good scholar but there is a violent sort of spirit which reigns here which begins already to show itself against him and i believe will increase daily for I find the clergy alarmed to a mighty degree against him, and last Sunday he had his welcome to this city by hearing himself harangued against out of the pulpit by a prelate of this country. Locke's Posthumous Works, edited by de Mazieux. Mr. Locke, in return, says, For the man I wish very well, and could give you, if it needed, proofs that I do so, and therefore I desire you to be kind to him but I must leave it to your prudence in what way and how far, for it will be his fault alone if he proves not a very valuable man, and have not you for his friend. To this Mr. Molyneux writes to Mr. Locke, 
i look upon mr tulland as a very ingenious man and i should be very glad of any opportunity of doing him service to which i think myself indispensably bound by your recommendation soon after this mr molyneux describes the treatment tulland underwent in ireland in another letter to locke he has had his opposers here as you will find by a book which i have sent to you the author peter brown is my acquaintance but two things i shall never forgive in his book the one is the foul language and opprobrious names he gives mr tolland the other is upon several occasions calling in the aid of the civil magistrate and delivering up mr tolland to secular punishment this indeed is a killing argument but some will be apt to say that where the strength of his reason failed him then he flies to the strength of his sword and this reminds me of a business that was very surprising to many the presentment of some pernicious books and their authors by the grand jury of middlesex this is looked upon as a matter of dangerous consequence to make our civil courts judges of religious doctrines and no one knows upon a change of affairs whose turn it may be next to be condemned but the example has been followed in this country and mr tolland and his book have been presented here by a grand jury not one of whom i am persuaded ever read one leaf in christianity not mysterious let the sorbonne for ever now be silent a learned grand jury directed by as learned a judge does the business much better the dissenters here were the chief promoters of this matter but when i asked one of them what if a violent church of england jury should present mr baxter's books as pernicious and condemn them to the flames by the common executioner he was sensible of the error and said he wished it had never been done mr locke in his reply coincides with his friend and says the dissenters had best consider but they are a sort of men which will always be the same a remark which one hundred fifty years has not failed in its truthfulness mr molyneux concludes his remarks in reference to tolland as follows mr tolland is at length driven out of our kingdom the poor gentleman at last wanted a meal's meat and the universal outcry of the clergy ran so strong against him that none durst admit him to their tables the little stock of money which he had was soon exhausted he fell to borrowing and to complete his hardships the parliament fell on his book voted it to be burnt by the common hangman and ordered the author to be taken into custody by the sergeant-at-arms and to be prosecuted by the attorney-general hereupon he is fled out of this kingdom and none here knows where he has directed his course from this correspondence we glean the following facts that john locke and mr molyneux were favorable to free thought that on locke's authority tolland possessed abilities of no common order that tolland was unjustly persecuted and he met with the sympathy of the liberals tolland having received a foretaste of his country's vengeance retired for two years to germany where he was welcomed by the first scholars of the age hearing that the house of convocation in london was about to denounce two of his works as heretical christianity not mysterious and amintor he hastened to england and published two letters to the prolocutor which were never laid before convocation he insisted that he should be heard in his own defence before sentence was passed on his works but as usual this wish was denied him a legal difficulty prevented the bishops from prosecuting the works and tolland gave the world a full account in his vindicius liberius the letters to serena written in a bold honest unflinching manner were the next performances of tolland the first letter is on the origin and force of prejudices it is founded on a reflection of cicero that all prejudices spring from moral and not physical sources and while all admit the power of the senses to be infallible all strive to corrupt the judgment by false metaphor and unjust premises Tolland traces the progress of superstition from the hands of a midwife to those of a priest, and shows how the nurse, parent, schoolmaster, professor, philosopher, and politician all combine to warp the mind of man by fallacies from his progress in childhood, at school, at college, and in the world. 
how the child is blinded with an idea and the man with a word the second letter is a history of the soul's immortality among the heathens a lady had been reading plater's phaedo and remarked as to how cato could derive any consolation from the slippery and vague suppositions of that verbiant dialogue toland therefore for her edification drew up a list of the specifications of the ancients on the subject analyzing in its progress the varying phases of the fables of the elysian fields the charons the Styx, etc deriving them all from the ancient egyptians toland thought the idea had arisen among the people like our witches ghosts and fairy stories and subsequently defended by the philosophers who sought to rule their passions by finding arguments for their superstitions and thus the rise of their exoteric and esoteric doctrines were the first foundations of the belief in the immortality of the soul the third letter is on the origin of idolatry or as it might rather be called a history of the follies of mankind he traces the causes the origin and the science of superstition its phenomena and its devotees proving that all the sacrifices prayers and customs of idolatry are the same in all ages they only differ in language and adaptability of climate and that with the fall of judicial astrology idolatry received its greatest blow for while men thought that priests could control destiny they feared them but this idea destroyed it removed the terror which so long had existed as an immediate object betwixt the man and this sacerdotal tyrant in letter fourth addressed to a gentleman in holland showing spinoza's system of philosophy to be without any principle or foundation and in the concluding article toland argues that motion is essential to matter in answer to some remarks by a noble friend on the above in the fifteenth section of this argument toland thus rebuts the allegation that were motion indissolubly connected with matter there must be extension without surface for motion or matter to exert their respective powers upon it is often used as an argument that if a vase was filled with any commodity to the utmost extent where would be the space for motion we know that in a kettle of water if there is no outlet for the steam which is the motion of the water the kettle will burst toland says you own most bodies are in actual motion which can be no argument that they have been always so or that there are not others in actual repose i grant that such a consequence does not necessarily follow though the thing may itself be true but however it may not be amiss to consider how far this actual motion reaches and is allowed before we come to treat of rest though the matter of the universe be everywhere the same yet according to its various modifications it is conceived to be divided into numberless particular systems vortices or whirlpools of matter and these again are subdivided into other systems greater or less which depend on one another as every one on the whole in their centres textures frame and coherence our sun is the centre of one of the larger systems which contains a great many small ones within the sphere of its activity as all the planets which move about it and these are subdivided into lesser systems that depend on them as his satellites wait upon jupiter and the moon on the earth the earth again is divided into the atmosphere ground water and other principal parts these again into the vegetable animal and mineral kingdoms now as all these depend in a link on one another so their matter is mutually resolved into each other for earth air fire and water are not only closely blended and united but likewise interchangeable transformed in a perpetual revolution earth becoming water water air air ether and so back again in mixtures without end or number the animals we destroy contribute to preserve us till we are destroyed to preserve other things and become parts of grass or plants or water or air or something else that helps to make other animals and they one another or other men and these again into stone or wood or metals or minerals or animals again 
or become parts of all these and of a great many other things animals or vegetables daily consuming and devouring each other so true it is that everything lives by the destruction of another all the parts of the universe are in this constant motion of destroying and begetting of begetting and destroying and the greater systems are acknowledged to have their ceaseless movements as well as the smallest particles the very central globes of the vortices revolving on their own axis and every particle in the vortex gravitating towards the center our bodies however we may flatter ourselves do not differ from those of other creatures but like them receive increase or diminution by nutrition or evacuation by accretion transpiration and other ways giving some parts of ours to other bodies and receiving again of theirs not altogether the same yesterday as to-day nor to continue the same to-morrow being alive in a perpetual flux like a river and in the total dissolution of our system at death to become parts of a thousand other things at once our bodies partly mixing with the dust and the water of the earth partly exhaled and evaporated into the air flying to so many different places mixing and incorporating with numerous things no parts of matter are bounded to any one figure or form, losing and changing their figures and forms continually, that is, being in perpetual motion, dipped or worn, or ground to pieces, or dissolved by other parts, acquiring their figures, and these theirs, and so on incessantly. Earth, air, fire, and water iron wood and marble plants and animals being rarefied condensed liquefied congealed dissolved coagulated or any other way resolved into one another the whole face of the earth exhibits those mutations every moment to our eyes nothing continuing one hour numerically the same and these changes being but several kinds of motion are therefore the incontestable effects of universal action but the changes in the parts make no change in the universe for it is manifest that the continual alterations successions revolutions and transmutations of matter cause no accession or diminution therein no more than any letter is added or lost in the alphabet by the endless combinations and transpositions thereof into so many different words and languages for a thing no sooner quits one form than it puts on another leaving as it were the theatre in a certain dress and appearing again in a new one which produces a perpetual youthfulness and vigor without any decay or decrepitness of the world as some have falsely imagined contrary to reason and experience the world with all the parts and kinds thereof continuing at all times in the same condition but the species still continue by propagation notwithstanding the decay of the individuals and the death of our bodies is but matter going to be dressed in some new form the impressions may vary but the wax continues still the same and indeed death is in effect the very same thing with our birth for as to die is only to cease to be what we formerly were so to be born is to begin to be something which we were not before considering the numberless successive generations that have inhabited this globe returning at death into the common mass of the same mixing with all the other parts thereof and to this the incessant river-like flowing and transpiration of matter every moment from the bodies of men while they live as well as their daily nourishment inspiration of air and other additions of matter to their bulk it seems probable that there is no particle of matter on the whole earth which has not been a part of man 
nor is this reasoning confined to our own species but remains as true of every order of animals or plants or any other beings since they have been all resolved into one another by ceaseless revolutions so that nothing is more certain than that every material thing is all things and that all things are but manifestations of one in his reply to Watton, who attacks those letters to Serena, Tullin says they were addressed to a lady, the most accomplished then in the world. The name of the lady will probably remain forever a mystery. In 1718 he published the celebrated work Nazarenus, or Jewish Gentile and Mohammedan Christianity which caused an immense sensation at the time it appeared, and led to his Manganentes, 1720, a work singularly profound and effective. In the same year he gave the world Tetradimus, containing Hodigus, or the pillar of cloud and fire, that guided the Israelites in the wilderness, not miraculous, but a thing equally practiced by other nations, Anclidophorus, or of the exoteric and esoteric philosophy, and Hypatia. There is a long preface to those books, from under an elm in Binsbury, or Chebum's camp, on the warren at the south end of Wimbledon Common, 1720. About this time, Pantheisticon appeared, written as a caricature on church liturgies, which Archdeacon Hare denounced as downright atheism. Along with the above, Toland wrote a multitude of small pamphlets. He translated the fables of Aesop, and published a poem entitled Cleto, which caused much excitement at the time, and, as it represented Toland's ideal character, we reprinted it in the London Investigator. His earlier political works were esteemed so valuable in the defense of the Protestant succession, and advancing the interests of the elector, subsequently King of England, that in one of his visits paid to that court he was presented by the electress with miniature portraits of herself and family the following is a catalogue of the works of toland which have never yet been published and the works in which they are mentioned the history of socrates in the life of harrington systems of divinity exploded an epistolary dissertation in christianity not mysterious the history of the canon of the new testament in Nazarenus, Republica Mosaica, in Nazarenus, a treatise concerning tradition, in Tetradimus. There were several other works, part of them written, which passed into the hands of Lord Molesworth, we believe, part of which were published, and the history of the Druid, and also Giordano Bruno, but whether they exist at the present time or not we are unable to say. There is also great difficulty in deciding as to the manner of Toland's life. Of this, however, we are certain that he caused great opposition in his own day, and he was patronized by able men. He edited an edition of Lord Shaftesbury's letters, and published a work of that noble lord's surreptitiously. He mingled amongst the German courts, and appeared on terms of equality with the elite of the philosophers and the aristocracy. The brief memoir prefaced to one of his works is an epistolary document addressed to a noble lord. His acquaintance with Locke, Shaftesbury, Collins, Molesworth, and Molyneux must have proceeded from other causes than his genius, or why was Toland exalted when Mandeville, Chubb, and the brave Woolston are never so much as alluded to? We consider that there is a strong probability that he was wealthy or at least possessed of a moderate competence. His abilities were of a curious order. He seemed to be one of a school which rose about this time to advocate free thought, but shackled by a dogma. His collegiate education gave him an early liking for the dead languages, and he carried out the notion of the ancients that the exoteric or esoteric methods were still in force. From a careful perusal of the works of the fathers, and the contemporary books of the heathens, he fancied that all the superstitions in the world differed but in degree, that religion was but the organic cause of superstition, the arguments made for it by the philosophers to propitiate the vulgar, 
this idea in the main was agreed to by woolston although his violent discourses which were addressed to the unlearned contain within them the germ of their intrinsic popularity yet even woolston's works notwithstanding their bluff exterior had something more within them than what the people could appreciate or even the present race of freethinkers can always understand for underneath that unrivalled vein of sarcasm there was in every instance an esoteric view which comprehended the meaning by which the earlier christians understood the gospels and rendered them on the same scale as the works of the ancients the renowned william whiston was another who interpreted scripture in a similar manner all those writers would have been swedenborgians if there had been no free thought while whiston would have been an atheist had there been no representative of that school we do not consider toland then as an absolute deist at that time the age was not so far progressed as to admit a biblical scholar into the extreme advanced list and when a man has spent the whole of his childhood in a sectarian family and his youth and early manhood in a university it is an impossibility to throw off at one struggle the whole of his past ideas he may be unfettered in thought and valiant in speech still there is the encyclopedia of years hanging upon him as a drag to that extreme development which he wishes but cannot bring his passions to follow not that we would by any means observe that tolland was comparatively behind his age but that even in his more daring works he still had a vague idea of scripture being partly inspired although overlaid with a mass of ecclesiastical verbiage it also seems a mystery how the works of woolston could be condemned his person seized while in the case of tolland we hear of nothing but his works being burnt why was convocation so idle why make idle threats and let their victim ramble at large was it because the one had powerful friends and the other had none or was it that in the earlier portion of the career of toland the invisible hand of bolingbroke stayed the grasp of persecution or was shaftesbury's memory so esteemed that his friend was untouched those particulars we cannot learn but they will take rank with other parallel cases as when the same government prosecuted Payne and gave gibbon a sinecure or nearer our own times when a series of men were imprisoned for atheism and sir william molesworth published similar sentiments without hindrance in the history of the soul's immortality toland thus gives the explanation respecting the exoteric and esoteric doctrines of pythagoras pythagoras himself did not believe the transmigration which has made his name so famous to posterity for in the internal or secret doctrine he meant no more than the eternal revolution of forms in matter those ceaseless vicissitudes and alterations which turn everything into all things and all things into anything as vegetables and animals become part of us we become part of them and both become parts of a thousand other things in the universe each turning into water water into air etc and so back again in mixtures without end or number but in the external or popular doctrine he imposed on the mob by an equivocal expression that they should become various kinds of beasts after death thereby to deter them the more effectually from wickedness though the poets embellished their pieces with the opinion of the soul's immortality yet a great number of them utterly rejected it for seneca was not single in saying not after death and death itself is not of a quick race only the utmost goal then may the saints lose all their hope of heaven and sinners quit their racky fears of hell we now dismiss john toland from our view he was one of the most honest brave truthful and scholastic of the old deists his memory will be borne on the wings of centuries and if ever a true millennium does arise the name of this sterling freethinker will occupy one of the brightest niches in its pantheon of worthies end of chapter eight of ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers by charles bradlaugh read for you by ted delorme